Hello and welcome to another episode of Talking Ball with Pat Leonard here in week 17. I am the New York Daily News' NFL columnist and Giants beat writer. Tons of things happening around the league. The Denver Broncos got a head start on the offseason firing head coach Nathaniel Hackett. But I was most interested by the Las Vegas Raiders benching Derek Carr. Carr's time in Vegas, you can see now, is done. A lot of speculation already has moved to what Josh McDaniels, Mark Davis, the owner, and the organization is going to do next at the quarterback position. And it's absolutely natural to connect the dots, draw a straight line from Tom Brady in Tampa, who he will be an unrestricted free agent, to Vegas, to the Raiders, to Josh McDaniels, his former offensive coordinator, winning all those championships in New England, and to say, hey, makes sense. Dana White, the UFC head, uh, the UFC president, you already a couple years ago had arranged Tom Brady to Vegas. Rob Gronkowski was going to follow him. It was supposed to be a done deal. And then according to White, John Gruden nixed it. Now Gruden's gone. That could happen again if Brady wants it to. Obviously, Brady had that you know dalliance tampering with the, the Miami Dolphins going for several years there that never worked out. We know he has his eyes constantly on what he thinks is the best situation for him. Does not appear like he is close to retiring after unretiring this past year. He said on his own podcast, the next time he retires, that'll be it. So he's going to take some time and really make sure that he is certain before he announces it one last and final time. To me, though, for the Raiders, for McDaniels, for Davis, Tom Brady should not be the answer. I don't think that Tom Brady, even though he would be possibly the best quick fix out there, would be smart from a sustainability standpoint. I think Josh McDaniel should want to get out of the shadow of running Patriots West out in the desert, out of Bill Belichick's shadow, out of Tom Brady's shadow. We know that he developed Mac Jones well as a rookie. We know that he did good work back with the Patriots with a young quarterback already, a quarterback who is now struggling without McDaniels. And frankly, that would be an exciting challenge and opportunity to draft a QB or even to maybe trade for a young Mac Jones, a guy he's familiar with who knows the system. And for the for the Raiders, they don't have the kind of roster that you can just sit there and say, oh, we'll plug in Tom Brady and then we're going to compete. We're going to win. We're going to make a run. Now they have competed. They've lost, I think, eight one score games, but the Las Vegas Raiders do not have a an offensive line that's so rock solid that Tom Brady's just going to stand back there untouched. Because let's face it, Brady's yards per attempts are down. His yards per completion are down. They're down significantly, several yards from the last two seasons in Tampa. He's not throwing the ball outside enough. He's making some good late game charges, but he's as much of a part of the Bucks' downturn and being frankly unwatchable as anyone on Tampa's team right now. Is there anything guaranteed about Tom Brady at 46 years old next fall fixing the Raiders? I would say this. I would say Josh McDaniels, if he's on the hot seat, if Josh McDaniels is under the gun to prove immediately that he needs to win, if his job is on the line in 2023, then I understand, you know, the desperation of grabbing a guy like Brady who knows the offense and where you feel confident you have a certain kind of floor or baseline of potential results. And certainly the star power, bring, you know, putting people in the seats in Vegas and trying to wipe away the disappointment of a bad year, all of that easily could be a factor. And, you know, it might happen. You know, I'm not saying it's not going to happen. I think there's a good chance it does happen. You know, you talk to people around the league, you already hear that this might be more than just noise and speculation that especially with them really, you know, cutting or not cutting car, but benching car. And of course, part of that was the injury guarantee. Part of it was performance, um, which a source told me performance. That was the quote. Uh, but certainly that looks like the Raiders already have somebody in mind. I want to take a quick break here and tell you, tell you about Bet Online. Basketball is back, and Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season. You'll always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends at Bet Online. 
And as your continued source for all sports wagering information, Bet Online features live betting, free contests, giveaways all season long. Always the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite sports and events, whether it's NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, or even golf. Head to betonline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use promo code BELIEVE, that's all caps B L E A V, to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. And so, where I start with the Raiders is Brady's going to be tempting, but maybe look at this from a long term view and try to build something sustainable. Are you going to win next year, even if Brady comes here to Las Vegas against Patrick Mahomes twice a season? Justin Herbert twice a season. Who knows what Denver is? But there's no guarantee it would be a fix. And I think even though the short-term pressure may lead to Brady ending up in silver and black, certainly it might make Devontae Adams happy. He clearly isn't pleased to see his friend and former college quarterback Derek Carr on the outs. It's the reason he joined and signed the team, got, you know, joined the Raiders in the first place. Um but I think that the longer term benefits of roster building with Dave Ziegler, GM, using a high draft pick that they will probably have in the top 10, presuming they lose one, if not two of their remaining games and finish six, uh, six and 11, it would be if they lose both. I believe that Josh McDaniel should carve out something of his own and not tie Brady to what is happening, especially if it if it works the way I think it would. And if Brady comes there and the Raiders remain mediocre, I think it will only stall the process that they have put in place and that they're trying to build um, in that new stadium and in a city where the NFL is really hoping a team will stick. And finally, I want to get to our guest this week, uh, Brooklyn-born offensive line coach at Pace Academy in Atlanta, Kevin Johnson. He coached, trained, and is now very proud of Andrew Thomas, the Giants' left tackle, the Chargers' left tackle, Jamari Sawyer, and Colts running back, Deion Jackson. Deion and Andrew will play against each other uh, in Week 17 at MetLife Stadium. It'll be the first time they are foes uh, in their lives. Um, and Andrew and Sawyer played with each other on the same team in middle school, in high school, and in college at Georgia. Um, and go read my story on the Daily News website, Andrew saying he was actually hoping someday he and Sawyer could play together in the NFL and kind of complete the process. But before we get to Johnson, just wanted to comment on Hackett's firing. Not surprised, saw it coming. Um, I think I was tweeting the day before he got fired. You know, they're probably going to have a next new head coach next season. It's not going to solve their problem. And that's what I wanted to mention. Russell Wilson is the problem. Russell Wilson is the problem in Denver. There's a lot of issues. Nate Hackett wasn't going to do uh, the job that was required. He wasn't equipped for it. He didn't do a good job. It's not like he doesn't deserve to get fired. But Russell Wilson is the reason that Nate Hackett didn't have time to at least iron out some issues to learn on the job. And, you know, George Payton, respected from his time in Minnesota, um, I do not think he should or will lose his job in Denver at the moment. Um, You know, he has a long track record of smart, sound decision making, uh, very well respected in the league, promise you. And it sounds like Denver's ownership is trusting him as being a big part of trying to fix this and clean it up. But the decision not only to acquire Wilson, but to give him the contract they did, and frankly, the sway in the building, you know, I'd, I had heard, frankly, in week one or two about, you know, facts about that Wilson was rubbing people the wrong way in the building, you know, not just his play, but just how much power and sway he had from personal coaches walking around to his own office space, things like that. Um, I think Wilson should and hopefully does learn from the mistakes that were made here and the mistakes he made and how I think he expected to walk right in and have everything click. And, um, you know, the bottom line is though, when you ask for all the power and you ask for all this sway and responsibility and you want to be treated like a star, 
You need to act like one. You need to be a leader and you need to show it on the field. Good for Jerry Judy for standing up for Wilson. Uh, They are going to need to be a huge part together of fixing this. And so that is definitely step one is stepping up and showing support for a guy who's been under a lot of scrutiny, but make no mistake about it. Don't, don't, think that any kind of cleanup that's done here on Russell Wilson's end, don't think of Hackett's firing as doing anything in regards to fixing what's really wrong with the Denver Broncos is that they have committed to a quarterback who is not playing the way he did in his prime, who's not playing well at all, and who needs to step it up big time immediately in all facets and phases if the Broncos are going to compete in one of the toughest divisions in football led by Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas city chiefs. We will be right back on talking ball with Kevin Johnson, the offensive line coach at pace Academy in Atlanta. All right. Welcome to talking ball with Pat Leonard have a special guest this week, the O-line coach at pace Academy in Atlanta, Kevin Johnson, Former offensive coordinator, wakes up way earlier than I do every day. I can tell you that. (laughs) Much more productive of a person. Um, But he's here to talk about, I mean, just a huge group of players, Kevin, uh, that you have coached, worked with, and provided structure for who are now in the NFL. The Giants, Andrew Thomas. The Colts, Deion Jackson. The Chargers, Jamari Sawyer at left tackle. How special is it for you? to watch these guys thrive and uh and be on the big stage um it's definitely special you know a uh, great opportunity and, and uh for these young men you know coming from a small school in atlanta private school which you know started football in 2008 i think the first varsity game and for these guys to do this and, and for the school for the community man this this is great it's incredible you have told me this before, but if you could tell our listeners, what is your daily routine? <laughs> so, um, you know, my, 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 my alarm goes off at three 30. And so, um, so three 30, I'm in the gym by four 30. Um, I'm at the school by six 15 and some of the guys who's there now will, will start training at about six 30 and they start classes at eight. So, um, and, you know, just just keep that daily grind going, you know. So and for those guys, because they're so young high school kids, I don't I, they do it two or three days a week. But um, but every day I get up every day and go go to the gym every day and get, get it going. And so what was it like when you first got your hands on Andrew Thomas? Now the Giants left tackle playing at an all pro level and the Chargers Jam- Jamari Sawyer, who is surprising people when you first got your hands on them early in high school. What were they like as people? What were they like as athletes? And how did they take to that regimen? Um, well, you know, it's, it's funny because uh, I kind of started the regimen like a little after they started. But um, but when I first got both of those guys, it, it was like walking in the park, you know, big eyes, and, and they didn't know what to expect. You know, both, both guys were actually really, really talented and really smart but didn't have the technique down. And of course they're coming from eighth grade. So most guys tell you to line up and, you know, move them out the way. Um, and so when they start to understand the technique of football, the things started clicking for them. Um, it clicked for Andrew sophomore year. Jamari got it towards his freshman year. So, um, and, you know, I was watching a tape a few weeks ago, Andrew freshman year, his first game ever. Oh, that was bad. <laughs> it was bad, <laughs> you know. So I had him at, you know, had him at left tackle. Yeah, you started um, him right away at left tackle. Yeah, right? oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you know, you walk, you see a kid like that. I mean, I've seen him this eighth grade year, and um, and the former head coach Chris Slade, who uh, former New England Patriots uh, standout. Um, first thing I told him, I said, "Hey, that's the that's the future left tackle." You know, I told Slade, I said, "That's to market purpose and a little bit again," and so. You know, Sage so looked at him and it was like, you know what, you may be right about that. And I'm like, you know, so UVA, I don't know if anyone noticed, but UVA was the first school that offered him, you know. Um, oh. and, I, and I told Slate, I said, listen, I said, that's the Marcus Burks all over again. The way he talked, the way he slumped his shoulders, the way, he, you know, just, just everything. It was just the Marcus Burks all over again. So, um, so was, you know, Slate and I, we, we laughed at it. And, you know, three years later, he's like, Kev, you, 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 I think you're right. 
you know, so so just you know, just when you when you go back and think about a lot of things, man, it's it's all unique things and all all fun and and, and great stories behind it. And you told me a fascinating story for uh, the story we just worked on in the New York Daily News on these three mm-hmm. young men now thriving. But I had never heard you tell it. I don't know if you'd ever ever told it before. But this idea that Jamari was so coveted by Georgia that they recruited Andrew, wanted Andrew, but also had an eye on Jamari and didn't have early expectations for Andrew. And then he wowed them right away as well. Oh, yeah. Um, and and- I think everyone on that coaching staff didn't think Andrew was going to come in and and do what he did. Um, I think the big push was for Jamari. Jamari was, I mean, number one lineman in the country his junior year and senior year. You know, so of course, you know, everyone knew that Jamari and Andrew went to junior high school together, went to Pace Academy together, and um, it, you know, it would be the cherry on top for him to go to Georgia. You know, it came down to Georgia and Clemson for Jamari, um, and um, but. When, when Andrew got there, I think Andrew had a chip on his shoulder, you know, for, for a number of reasons. One of the reasons we had some, you know, local, you know, reporters, you know, um, writing bad things about him. Um, mm-hmm. But he was soft and, you know, um, he didn't care about football and he was more into his music and post football. So I think that put a little chip on the shoulder. Um, but when he went in to Georgia, you know, um, we made sure he was ready. I'll just say that. Like, you mm-hmm. know, we we made sure we stressed the fact that these are the things you have to do. These are the things that I'm seeing what they did previous years. Um, this is what the D lineman does. This is what you have to look for. And um, and you know, it's kind of like a, a father and son type of deal. When you let him go, you're kind of texting him every day. You uh <laughs> you call him every day, hey, how did it go? How did how did camp go? How did practice go? You know, for me, it was just a little anxiety just because this was my first one, you know, um, and, mm. you know, and what I mean by first one, first one of an offensive lineman, you know, I, I named my business after those guys, the Big Dolls Club, you know, because I felt like, you know, these are the guys we're going to set precedent with. And, um, and, and you, as you know, and everyone else know, um, Andrew, junior year, Jamari, sophomore year, um, we ran the ball. Like, you know, we were called the Big Dolls Club for a reason. We ran the ball. And mm. Deion, Deion Jackson benefited from us, you know, pounding the ball, you know. So, but, um, but yeah, it, you know, for Andrew, it, the expectation wasn't high for him. Right after the first week, it was kind of like, oh, okay, we're going to put him at guard. You know, Coach Pittman called me back the next week. Hey, we're going to put him at right tackle. Because I think Isaiah Wynn was at the left tackle who got drafted, I think, 31st overall. Um, to a New England Patriots, and so uh, when when uh, when left, Andrew filled that spot, and then you know that became his spot. He was a household name. That's great. It's great stuff. I can see why people would have the misconception that Andrew is. Um, I wouldn't use the word soft, but he's quiet and he's such a nice guy yeah. that I could see somebody who doesn't get to know him and doesn't know football rushing to some sort of judgment. But he's got a fire in him. Um, he is a great person, oh, but yeah. he really has a fire. And that, I don't think you've seen it any better than, and I'm sure you've been watching this closely as well, the way that he's had so much different kinds of coaching early. And then mm-hmm. obviously it didn't start well for the Giants as a whole when he was a rookie, mm-hmm. let alone him. The way that he's come out of it so much better and so strong and playing like one of the best tackles in the league like I think it speaks a lot to how prepared he has been, but also the fact that he's as much of a dog as anybody out there. Like that's what I see. Yeah, I mean he, he's a dog, and and um, you know he he he's not a gangster, right? He's not a a guy who is going to be out doing the things that he's supposed to be doing. He's a football player, right? So that's what he's yeah. supposed to do. And all now all football players are these barbaric guys, right? He's a guy just mild-mannered, and he does the job. I, I, I tell anybody this all the time. One thing about my guys, they're going to know the playbook inside out, no matter what position they're in, right? When they're playing guard, when they're playing tackle, tight end, they're going to know the playbook, you know? And that young man knows the playbook. You know, it's so many guys that I'm not going to, you know, call any names out, but there are guys out in the league right now who he's carried because they didn't know the playbook. Hey, you got to do this. Hey, you got to do that. And and me watching closely, I can tell what he's doing. 
<laughs> I can tell when I can tell when Jamari's doing it. Hey, you got this, you know. And and so the hesitation of the guy that's playing next to him, you can tell he didn't know what the hell he was doing. You know, so <laughs> so you know, so it's just you know those guys. Like I said, those guys well prepared. He's well prepared, and so like I said, there's a misconception when people say he's soft because he's quiet. You yeah, know, um, right. and, you know, I if I'm someone else, I don't want to see the beats come out. You know, um, these guys make the playoff. They win tomorrow. You're gonna see a different guy. I, I'm, I'm, I just, you know, I, I know right now. And he just texted me two seconds ago. I know right now he got a fire in his belly. You know, um, and and again, I didn't say anything about the Pro Bowl, but <laughs> I, 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 I sense he got the fire in his belly. You know, so um, I just hope the, you know, the other Giants team got the same fire in their bellies and because they can beat anybody, but you know. Um, but you got to put it all together. You got to be all four quarters, you know? Yeah. And I'm, ex- I'm excited like you are to see Andrew in, yeah. in that playoff atmosphere. So when I talk this week to Dion Jackson, to Jamari Sawyer, to Andrew Thomas, mm-hmm. uh, they all mentioned the blueprint when they talked yeah. about you. What, what yeah. is coach Kev's blueprint that has helped so, them get here? So the blueprint man is, is based upon the person, you know, um, the first thing I ask a kid, you know, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? Right. It's kind of bigger than football in some sense. So I kind of write down what they want. I got this book that I, I keep in my office with every kid who I've touched, basically, come across, came across. And um, write down their goals, write down what do they want to do, what they want to be. So anytime a kid says, hey, coach, I want to be a college division one college football player. I want to play pro ball. You know, so for that means I got to I got to apply pressure on for them reaching their goal and um so that's that's part of the blueprint and, and um and like i said writing down all the goals writing down what they want to do what they should do what they shouldn't do and um so we just start applying those you know ethics to what they want to do and, and we kind of go from there hmm. and um clearly clearly an effective program um, it, I look at these guys all coming out of you working with them and pace. And I say to myself, who's next, you know, cause that, that was my first thought is, wow, this is really special. My next thought is who's coming down the pike. You know, if this is, uh, if this is working that well, who's, uh, who's starring for you guys at the moment? Well, I got, uh, Trevon, uh, his name is Trevon Ball. Um, who is, uh. I think he's going to be one of the best that came out of Pace Academy. 6'4", 315, um, going to the University of South Carolina. And um, the difference between Chavon Ball, um, Jamari, and Andrew, um, Chavon got a little more of my attention, you know, because Jamari and Andrew have both of them together, right? And uh, Chavon, he got a little more of my attention. His determination is impeccable. Like Javon, when I got Javon, he couldn't shoot come and walk. Right. It was different. And um, and so for him, he doesn't want to fail. Like failing to Javon is like the worst thing in the world. I mean, this kid mm. in the classroom, he's the same way. He has to work just as hard in the classroom as is on the field. You know, like Jamari and Andrew, the classroom was so easy for those guys. Those guys, they can miss two weeks of class and catch right back up. You know, we got a saying at Pix Academy, you miss one day of you, you miss one day of school, that's like missing a whole week. Right. Yeah. And so, um, and like Javon, he drives forty five minutes away every day for four years and has never been late. Wow. You know, so when you get a kid that's determined like that, yeah. Um, when you get a kid that works hard, I'm gonna say he's next. He, he's, he's 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 next. Man, I'm looking forward to watching him with the Gamecocks. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you too about, so everybody's journey is different. And yeah. I looked at how, you know, Andrew's a top five pick. Dion Jackson goes undrafted. Jamari falls to the sixth round, yeah. but they've all, they've all persevered. But I was wondering, like, from your point of view, how did each guy handle the different pressures or disappointments or, you know, successes that kind of came with that part of the journey because they've all gotten through now to mm-hmm. contributing on an NFL field, but that's definitely a hurdle or uh, a period of time where things could go different ways. 
Yeah, I think for uh for for Andrew, it happened so fast. You know, um, I remember like it was yesterday. He was talking to Coach Judge. I want to say like a Tuesday, and um, so the last thing Coach Judge was saying out the phone was like, "Hey, answer your phones. I'm gonna give you a call on Thursday." <laughs> right, and so um, so he was upstairs. It was in my old house. He was upstairs in like the loft, and when he came downstairs, I looked at him. I said. Hey man, you going back to my hometown, you know? And he was like, think so coach? I said, yeah. And so, uh, the day of the draft, uh, we had a young lady out, I forgot Emily last name. My name is Emily. She works for channel 46 news. Mm. So she was in my home. And then we had, uh, Jeff Sintel from dog nation in my home. And so when the fourth pick came up, when the third pick came up, I told the news people, Hey, get the country cameras on. Right. So I had my I had my lap, I had my iPad going and you can hear me and say an iPod, an iPad, hey, get your cameras on. And um <laughs> and so they all they kept the cameras on. It's like, you know, I looked at uh Andrew Agent, uh John Thornton from Rock Nation and I was just like, This is the pick. And so he looked at me and, and we looking at each other and um you know at the time it was COVID, so we couldn't have everyone in the screen. There was only seven people could be in the screen. Right. Like draft day. Right. And so um, so everybody cut the cameras on. So the phone rang from from New York City um, uh, area code. So then it hung up. And so then it rang again and it was <laughs> close judge. So at that time, we all excited. I'm excited because I'm like, OK, I knew this was going to happen. Right. And so um, so for, for, for Drew, man, that that all that happened, it was beautiful. But he struggled his first eight games of the season. He struggled, right? I mean, different coaching, um, coming with COVID, no rookie year. So, you know, they was already basically, ah, he's a bust, right? Just because everyone was promoting their guys as the top pick, they should pick them just that the third, right? Yeah, right. You know, so, you know, so that happened. So his journey was different. Um, Dion went to the University of Duke, Duke University, and um, – you know, we always say if we had to, if we if we could have done it over, you know, but we took the same steps with Dion. And I'm gonna say yes. And and the reason why I'm gonna say yes for you know when Dion left me, Dion was still immature. Um and again, you know, I use that phrase, you know, don't miss the bus. You know, and, and so you know, I, I would talk that. to Dion, you know, once a week, you know, maybe twice a week sometimes and, and just kind of give her that confidence, giving him, you know. Uh, a father figure, mentor type of, you know, conversations with him. And so um, got to his second year. He had the most outstanding sophomore year there there was, right? And I wish he could have came out of sophomore year. But, you know, unfortunately, that's the rules of the NFL. But um, junior year, you know, kind of had a, you know, injury. Senior year, she had, she had reps and just didn't work out, you know. And I, and I told Dion this. I said, listen, you got to find one team that loves you. That's it. You know, um, the coach loved me from the beginning. You know, um, a representative from the coach when DR ran his 4 3 um, at his pro day, he, he told DR he's an asshole, you know, um, in a joking way, you know, <laughs> because, um, you know, they wanted they they wanted Dion to stay underneath the radar. Right? Yeah, right, we, right. We all, we all you, kind of knew keep that. Keep you a secret, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, so for <laughs> Dion, draft day was there, myself, Andrew. Um, and two other his friends were, you know, with Dion and, you know, just eating wings and waiting for the sixth round to go, seventh round. So he started getting all these calls. And so, I, you know, Dion's upstairs and I'm downstairs and he's on, he's texting with his agent and, you know, hey, coach, what should I do? And I'm just like, you know, Baltimore Ravens was like, hey, we'll give you this, we'll give you this, 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 this. And, you know, and for me, like watching Baltimore for a lot of years, I'm like, man, this is good. You know, this is a good offense for, you know, for Dion and, you know, but then, uh, you know, back in my mind, I knew the coach really wanted Dion. And I knew that. And I'm like, hey, if you're going to make any team, you're going to make that coach team. Even though you had four or five guys in front of him. And actually, he had six guys in front of him when he did choose to go to coach. So he went from the, the seventh guy to the fifth guy, the fifth guy, to the third guy, the third guy, to the second guy. And I'm bouncing back and forth, you know. And so yeah. he's understanding the process and the business of this. So for Dion, I think his his process is more the business side of it, you know, opposed to the playing. I think everyone knows an NFL just get as talented. You know, so gotcha. it's a contract, you know, you got to do a contract next year. So 
you know, so we'll see what happens, you know. And then um, and for Jamari, you know, um, it was a bittersweet opportunity, you know, a bittersweet moment, you know. Um, you know, he did the draft in my house as well. And um, you know, we thinking he's gonna slip. We thought maybe, maybe fourth round, no later than that. You know, and the fifth round came, you know, myself, his agent, Jamari sat outside on my front <laughs> in the front porch. He's like, all right, man, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta come up with a plan. You know, um, you know, my my ordeal was like, hey, we gotta pick a team. Let's, you know, let's go to New York. Let's go with the Giants. You know, mm-hmm. um, and the reason being because, you know, the big brothers there, right? Um, uh, you got some teammates who we play with at Georgia's there, so I know that that movement would have been a lot comfortable for Jamari. You know, but Jamari's one of those kids. You could put him in a jungle. He gonna make the lions dance, right? So that's the type <laughs> of person he is. So, um, well, and I knew, and I knew that um, if this was gonna happen, you know, I was telling John, hey, we we got got to got to choose New York because I know he'll have opportunity to make the team. You know, so um, a lot of calls was made, a lot of you know shuffling around, and you know, saying he could call. Um, I mean, LA Chargers called and. And you know, rest is history. And yeah. you know, um, Jamari got his first start. He called me Monday night. Actually, he called me Monday night. I'm actually watching Drew. Um, I posted been on a plane. Actually, going to see that game Monday night. Um, some things got changed at practice, so I was able to make it. He called me Monday night and said, "Hey, I got to start." So, I, I, as he talking to me, I'm booking my flight. You know, I gotta. You know, this kid, I gotta go see him play. You know, it is. I think it's just so important for me to be there. Um, and when he got his first stop, and, and he dominated. I mean, I I ain't never seen a rookie play like that. I mean, mm-hmm. I was like, uh, they first game, first game out, and I was kind of like, okay, we got something special here. You know, and, and like I said, again, I already knew what kind of kid he was, what kind of play he is. But for him to do what he did and how he did it and the fashion he did it in, I, I was I was really impressed. So, you know, um, so, you know, all three guys got a different journey, different story. Yeah, he was uh I was really grateful too. Like I I put the story together fairly last minute, even though it's been on my mind for a while. And both Jamari and Dion did interviews on the phone, like basically walking off the practice field. Couldn't have been nicer. Jamari said, you know, you can tell he's appreciative of the moment. Like he even said running out of the tunnel on Monday night football was a big deal to him. Yeah. Um, that it really felt special he and Dion exchanged jerseys after the game mm-hmm. Dion says he better get Andrews after the game uh yeah. on Sunday at MetLife um yeah. wanted to ask you I forgot to mention this when um I introduced you but as you referenced you were born you were born in New York City you're born in Brooklyn born in Brooklyn mm-hmm. and uh so when Andrew goes to New York did you know that he as a guy from New York did you know he had what it takes to handle New York um, I, I did because, um, you know, he he comes from a very, very great home, you know, and, um, if, and, 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 you know, like everyone else knows you from New York, if you're a humble person in New York City, you'll make it, right? You'll, you'll make it. If you come with the arrogant attitude and, you know, the, you know, big mouth, you, you won't last long, you know, but I knew he can, I knew he could make it. And I knew it was going to take some time for him to get used to the media, you know, uh, the things that's being said in a paper or, or, you know, on the news and things of that nature. You know, I got calls from his mom, you know, coach, this is what they said about, you know, Andrew. Coach, they said this and said, you know, I said, hey, listen, I said, it's part of the business. I said, it's part of the business. It's going to be all right because he's going to turn it around because the kid has a lot of pride. And so, um, so you know, it's, it's he started turning around slowly but surely. And um, and I, I, I'll be honest with you, y'all haven't seen the best of this kid yet. I haven't seen the best of him, and, it, it, and and it's it's taken him just as long as it took while he was at Georgia, just as long as when he was at Peace Academy. He didn't come out the door being the best best player and, and things of that nature. It took him some time, but he, when you, when y'all see that when y'all see that, and I always say great players are consistent. That's what you're going to see more of of consistency. You know, injury free, he's gonna be so persistent. 
Yeah, I was gonna. I was just gonna mention that. Like the, the reality is, for listeners, I mean, most listeners might know, but for those who don't know, had two different procedures the last couple of years on that same left ankle. Uh, yeah. The first one didn't rectify what was going on. The second one, they mm-hmm. hope and believe, did. I think we see the results um, yeah. of it now. But he really was working hard, even in camp. I mean, he was really laboring to get to the point he is now. Mm-hmm. I've been trying to come up with a nickname for him because it's been. It's he's he's locked down so much on the left side. I was thinking, you know, around Christmas time, like silent night, because you don't hear from the left side. You mm-hmm. call him the quiet man because you don't hear from mm-hmm. the guy he's blocking. Yeah. I don't and he's also kind of a quiet dude. So I don't know. I'm yeah. I'm playing around with that, but I think the bottom line is when the Giants drafted him, Kevin, and you know this, like they saw sometimes O lineman versatility is a great thing and mm-hmm. you know all that, but they saw a left tackle. And right. they saw a guy who could be a left tackle for 12 to 15 years, you know? Right. And I think this season, um, I think this season we have seen that. And I know you said, you said you didn't mention it, but in my opinion, mm-hmm. he could be an all pro, let alone, mm-hmm. he definitely should have been a pro bowler. And mm-hmm. I was, I was stunned. Like you yeah. usually, sometimes you're really close to a team, but then when you back away, you say, Oh yeah, yeah. No, around the league, there's a lot of good players. But he is without question one of the best three tackles in the NFC this season. Wouldn't yeah. you agree? I, I definitely agree. Um, and you know, I took notes all year and and on on, on my guys, right? And and only because like I like to when they come home and they done, I like to share my notes with them, share my thoughts and you know, not to criticize them, but just just what I think, what I see. You know, and I tell this to guys all the time. I never played pro before, right? But I just know what I just know what's needed, and um, and there's certain things that he has to do to be consistent. Certain things he should have done against Michael Parson, right? Mm. But he didn't. But um, but I know he'll 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 get it done this year. I mean, next year, you know. So um, so I like I said, I you know, the consistency part is what makes you great. Right. And that's that's what anything you do. Right. And um, like for me, I want to be I want to be great. You know, when they put me in the dirt, I want them to say, hey, man, he was the baddest old line coach, you know, that, that came through this place. And um, but I got to be consistent on pumping them out every three, four years. Right. That's my you know, that's my goal. I want to be able to have a flock of guys and, you know, they all came from the same, the big dolls camp and, and they all being consistent. And again, everyone can't go pro, but the ones who say they want to go pro and who put the work in to go pro, those ones that's going to make it because you're going to have every opportunity to put yourself in that position. You can find Kevin on Instagram. It's O-Line Guru, G-O-O-R-O-O. There's some underscores in there, but you'll find them. Just type in O-Line. You should be able to find them. And then when is when do you hold that camp? Is that an annual camp, the Big Dogs camp? Um, Actually, I started Big Dogs training in the last week of January. Oh. So, um, yeah, you get so right I into start, it. Yeah, I start with off uh, middle school kids, um, high school kids, and then sometimes some college guys come back or whatever, you know, and they bring some whatever. We'll we'll get some work in. Um, you know, I, I, I text Jamari and Andrew. I say, hey, man, it's probably about time y'all get back in the lab. You know, um, you know, you know, get back where it started from. You know, That's and right. sometimes, you know, I, I I like when guys go to other people and train with other people. I like to go and exert, you know, Jamari trained with Willie Anderson, who I think is a, you know, Hall of Famer one day. And, um, and Paul Alexander, I don't know if you know who Paul Alexander is, but I do, a long yeah. time, yeah, a long time coach at, uh, at Cincinnati Bengals. And, you know, both Andrew and Jamari trained with Paul and, and Jamari. And, um, I love, I, and I go watch, I love to see those guys, um, put their twists to the training part of it, you know? And so I, you know, for me, I take a little bit from everyone you know, and, um, and try to insert that with my guys. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this, the, the new start. I'm excited about, um, I got some new people who, uh, wants to start training. And so I'm excited about that. Got some young kids, man. Got a kid who is 12 years old, six foot five already, you know, um, Ooh. big hands, wear size four and a half, four X gloves, you know? So when I see guys like this, man, I'm just kind of, I get excited because, um, it's more than training. It's a lot of mentoring that goes into this as well. Um, keep it around me, keep it around my family. Um, I like to do things like that just because it's more than just football. 
Kevin, you're doing great work. Congratulations on all the success to you, yeah, Pace that. Academy, to these guys. And uh, hope to talk to you soon. Maybe we'll see you at a playoff game soon. Yeah, yeah. you know, I just I was just texting with uh with those guys' agents and um with Jamari and uh, Andrew agent and um and you know he was like, hey man, if they both go to the playoffs, we're gonna have to hope we play on different days. And, and you know, um if if it look it looks like the Chargers is gonna be traveling to Cincinnati, Ooh. that's what it look like if it's all if all said and done. So I'll fly out. I'll fly there. And then we'll figure out if Andrew and him get in and where to go from that point. But I'm hoping it's on two different days, and so I can, you know, go to both of them. I, I like I said, for me, I, I uh, you know, I want to support in every in every way, man. And you know, being at the first playoff game is exciting. You know, it's, it's exciting to me, man, just to just to talk about these guys with you and and um and the things that they're doing. You know, so um, all positive things, man. All positive. I sincerely appreciate your time and uh, yeah. see you on the playoff trail. Yes, sir. Man, Happy New Year to you and your family, man. Thank you. Same to you, Kevin. Take care. All right. Take care. All right. Let's get over to Pat's picks for week 17. Reminder, you can find all of my picks against the spread on my Instagram account at PL on NFL. This is brought to you by betonline.ag. My best bet, the Carolina Panthers, three-point underdogs, at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I love the Panthers here. On Bet Online, this line has moved to plus four. So obviously, love the Panthers there as well. Uh, 320 yards rushing last week against Detroit. The Bucs' run defense isn't Detroit's, but it hasn't been good enough. And Tampa's frankly unwatchable. I mean, they are not a good team. The Buccaneers are not good enough in any facet of the game right now. They've lost three of their last five, while the Panthers are playing as well as really any team in football right now especially from the standpoint of they're still alive. This is a huge game, of course, uh, for the NFC South. And Steve Wilkes has done a terrific job as the interim coach since Matt Rule was fired. They have won three of the last four, and I think they absolutely cover in this situation. Uh, The Seahawks, plus two and a half at home against the Jets. This line has moved. It is now, I think, as we speak, Seahawks plus one, still underdogs in their own stadium to a Jets team with Mike White coming back in at quarterback, but hard for me to sit there and call the Jets a team that's good enough to say that they should be favored on the road in one of the most hostile environments in the NFL. Love the Seahawks there. They've been losing games. Uh, Their defense hasn't played up to snuff, but I do think that Geno Smith can get one over on his former team. And then finally, Giants fans, this one's for you. Love the Giants to blow out the Colts. They are five and a half point favorites at home. Um, I think they will make quick work of Indianapolis. They have no excuse to not do so. And frankly, I think Brian Dable would not be able to sleep on Sunday night if he lost to Jeff Saturday. You have a guy who's been toiling and coaching since 1997. He's been in the NFL NFL since 2000 as a grunt for the Patriots. Dable waiting till 2022 to be a head coach, going up against a guy who got pulled off an ESPN set on November 13th to coach against the Raiders. Give me a break. So those are my picks for week 17. This has been Talking Ball with Pat Leonard. Again, happy new year. Thanks as always. Please rate, review, subscribe here on YouTube at PL on NFL. And follow me on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, all the stars, all the ratings, everything helps us get the word out that we are bringing you insight that you don't get anywhere else, important conversations about the NFL and the spreads every week. So thanks as always for joining. We will see you next time.